Last year, I made a video about some of the magazines I use for research when I'm making videos. I didn't expect it to get that many views, but it actually did a lot better than I expected, so I thought I'd make another, and give a spotlight to some well-known and lesser-known magazines from the 1920s that they rarely get. So, let's get into it. First, I want to talk about two of the most useful magazines I've discovered since making that first video. If you've been following my uploads, these names will probably be familiar to you. First up is Exhibitor's Trade Review. This was a movie industry trade magazine that I've been using for the series on how 1920s movies were advertised. Now, being a trade magazine, it wasn't very mainstream outside of the movie industry, and was targeted at movie exhibitors. In the early 1920s especially, film distribution and film exhibition were very separated, aside from the big theaters owned by big movie studios. Movie studios, big and small, needed to reach out to independent theater owners, who would decide which movies they wanted to show at their theater. This is where Exhibitor's Trade Review was useful. In the magazine, studios could advertise their new movies, and give previews for upcoming movies. And exhibitors could be informed about how much money bigger theaters were making from which movies, as well as promotional ideas and advertising strategies. Because, just as the exhibitors were responsible for purchasing movies, they also had to advertise at their theaters by themselves. And this is the most fascinating part about Exhibitors Trade Review for me. So often, it features photos showing how these exhibitors advertised inside or outside their theaters. This usually involved decorating the entrance and lobby of their theater for whatever big feature they wanted to bolster. While some of the big studios offered some advertising components, the exhibitors often had to think up and make the decorations themselves. This had the effect of having a wide variety of decorations, showing many different approaches with varying degrees of pageantry. And it can really help us now to understand the selling points of these movies, which is especially useful when looking at lost films. When I'm making one of my Lost Films videos, I'm often able to find a photo showing these kinds of advertisements. But this wasn't the only kind of advertising that exhibitors did, no sir. What is probably more interesting are the many kinds of publicity stunts they tried out. These would often venture outside of the theater itself, possibly just outside the marquee, or just around the corner from the theater, or maybe even far out into the town or city. This could involve interactive props, fashion shows, vehicles with cheeky movie ads on them, or look-alike contests. The most interesting one I've found so far is a publicity stunt for the movie One Clear Call, which features the Ku Klux Klan as a major part of the plot. One theater did this to advertise the movie. Yeah, a strategy that wouldn't exactly work today, to say the least. A lot of the articles and short pieces featured in Exhibitor's Trade Review are very business-oriented, so it doesn't really make for very interesting reading most of the time. The most interesting things to read in it are the movie reviews, and once again, these are very useful for my Lost Film videos, especially because they do a rundown of the plot as well as a brief evaluation of the movie's entertainment value and appeal. Although, the magazine did take money from the big studios for advertising, so it's entirely possible that the reviews are a bit biased, so it's always good to cross-reference them with independent reviewers. However, there are negative reviews, so I'm not really sure what to think of it. Now, let's quickly go over to a very similar magazine, Exhibitor's Herald. It targeted the same readership as Exhibitor's Trade Review, talked about most of the same things, and featured film reviews. I think the most interesting thing that Exhibitors Herald offered that Exhibitors Trade Review didn't was extensive coverage on theaters themselves. This was found in the Better Theaters section, though it wasn't in every issue of the magazine. I featured some of this coverage in my videos on some of the big movie palaces. Just like Lost Films, many of these once grand movie palaces are now gone forever, and they were also a big part of the overall movie watching experience for many people. And you can find some absolutely incredible photos of movie palaces and theaters, as well as the smaller architectural details. And there will definitely be more videos featuring them in the future. Exhibitors Herald also had a lot of information on theater equipment like projectors and even furnishings like theater seats, with great photos and advertisements for those kinds of things. It's a nice look behind the scenes that most people don't really think very much about. Exhibitors Herald also had a nice pictorial section that shows industry-related photos, behind-the-scenes shots, and publicity photos. 
I also like that they often have photos of big movie stars posing with a copy of Exhibitor's Herald, even though most of them wouldn't really have had much of a reason to know about the exhibition side of things. And there are also a lot of movie stills that are very helpful for researching lost films. Best of all, the advertisements that studios put into Exhibitor's Herald are sometimes just amazing. The issues from the later years of the decade are especially great. There are whole collections of ads with stunning, colorful artwork, usually featured when big studios were announcing their new season of features. And outside of ads for individual movies, there are also ads for the studios themselves. Exhibitor's Trade Review also had similar ads, so really you can look at either. As with pretty much all the primary sources I use, you can find both Exhibitor's Trade Review and Exhibitor's Herald on the Internet Archive, and I highly recommend them for any sort of research into 1920s Hollywood and the industry as a whole. Okay, now let's move away from movies. In recent months, two of my biggest videos have been the ones about futurism. I found quite a few of the photos and articles for part two in a magazine called Popular Science. Unlike many of the other sources for those futurism photos, this magazine did not have Hugo Gernsback as an editor, although they did sometimes reprint some of his stuff. But if you're interested in how science and engineering have progressed, or you want to know more about how 1920s technology worked in a technical sense, then look no further. Personally, I'm not very interested in the minute details in technology and engineering, and yet popular science, unsurprisingly, also appealed to a more general audience. I've made a couple of short videos of features from popular science before, usually being nothing more than pictures with short captions. But simplicity is often the key to understanding, which is why I like to feature them. Some of these simple features talk about things we might overlook about the past these days, like how the post office worked or what happened to nickels used for payphones. Not to mention, it focused a lot on the latest and greatest technological advances of the day, like radio and airships. Airships especially being a very forgotten mode of transportation, I love learning more about them, though the design details and all that go way over my head. Popular Science also featured a lot of photos, and you might see some more of these photos scattered around in future videos. One of the most interesting sections for us in the present day is where they briefly mention recent inventions, with photos to go with them. Some of the inventions are very technical things that I don't understand or really care about, but others are more like novelty inventions to solve specific everyday annoyances, most of which never caught on, so they can be pretty entertaining. I'll probably start a series for those at some point in the future. And if you're a car person, there's also sometimes a section showing the latest developments in automobiles, especially accessories and conveniences, so take a look at that if you'd like. You might have noticed that for all of these magazines so far, I keep mentioning the photos, and that's because these are usually photos that just don't come up when you search online, so you can make a lot of new discoveries when flipping through these magazines, though the quality isn't always the best. I mean, they're imperfect scans of images reprinted with old technology, but they're worth a look anyway. Next, we'll move to yet another type of magazine, one that I've been featuring a lot on this channel in the past year, and that's The Outlook. The Outlook was a general interest news sort of magazine. Each issue started off with a series of short articles discussing recent newsworthy events or developments. These ranged from political, economic, social, diplomatic, and so on. Basically, a little taste of everything that was going on in 1920s America, and glimpses into other things abroad. I just love how it's almost like a chronological encyclopedia that you can follow along with, through the trepidation, confusion, and triumphs of a decade. It's generally objective with its news, although sometimes it noted that the editors of the Outlook didn't agree with something. And the Outlook also had longer articles that were written by a wide variety of people, some of them being very prominent political figures at home and abroad. So it's a nice array of different perspectives. There aren't as many photos since it's more of a serious news outlet, but I personally love browsing through to discover 1920s news events that have been forgotten and would make for a good video. It's always good for channels to make videos about things that other channels haven't really talked about, and the Outlook can be a very useful tool for me to do that. The Outlook also compiled a few political cartoons from various newspapers around the country in pretty much every issue, sometimes sharing a theme. I've already used some of these cartoons in previous videos. It's a great resource because many of these newspapers are not available for free online. The last magazine I want to talk about is one much more familiar to everyone, The New Yorker. It's mostly known for being a classy, middle-class urban magazine featuring literature from prominent authors, and it was. But for research purposes, those works of fiction can be more easily accessed elsewhere these days. 
Unfortunately, the Internet Archive only has the 1925 issues at the moment, which was the New Yorker's first year, so those are the only ones I've looked at so far. But there's still a lot of cool things to look at in those issues. What's especially interesting for me are the lesser-known things in it. Two things stick out in particular. First, there was a profile section, which had full-page features on one important person at the time of publication, complete with the very unique and stylized caricature of that person. This is a great way to see who was influencing society then, some still famous and others kind of forgotten. I randomly selected three people from the profile section that give a good representation of what kind of people were featured. Lawyer Max Stoyer, music critic and composer Deems Taylor, and American General Pershing. And each profile features that witty, sophisticated style that the New Yorker was known for. The other interesting thing is the lipstick column, or as it's known in the magazine, Tables for Two. This was a short column written by Lois Long, a young 20-something woman with a biting wit. She wrote of her exploits in speakeasies around New York City under the pseudonym Lipstick. She was the epitome of a liberated, modern woman, who put herself on the same level as men. So not only did she write her observations of the speakeasies themselves and criticisms of prohibition, she represented what most people today would consider the quintessential flapper. While she may not have represented the majority of actual flappers in the 20s, it's still a fascinating look into two of the things people are most interested in concerning the 20s. I would love to see all the lipstick articles published in a nice print edition. I tried looking for something like that online, but I couldn't find anything. You know, like those nice leather-bound books that have collections of classic literature? I love collecting those. And let's not forget that iconic art by Rhea Irvin and Ralph Barton, both on the covers and other drawings inside. These drawings included caricatures and cartoons, often coupled with text using the signature wit and satire of the magazine. It's always fun to look at the cartoons especially, and once you learn more about society at that time, it's easier to understand the jokes, whether they're in the New Yorker or in other satirical magazines. So that's all I have for now. I do know a couple more magazines that I can talk about in a future installment, but not enough for a new video, so I'm not sure yet if that's going to happen. All of these magazines are on the internet archive, though not all of the issues are available, but I highly, highly recommend checking them out there if you're interested. So, which of the magazines in this video was the most interesting to you? Let me know in the comments. And if you didn't catch part 1, I'll put a link for that in the description. Well, that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age.